Hello and welcome everyone to the Systems Change Network, Building the Disability Vote. Today's training is going to be the first in a two-part series about building and empowering the disability vote in California. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we get started, a uh, special thanks to Rosemary, who helped us with all of our logistics earlier on. Uh, if you have any questions, remember you can go and ask Rosemary um, questions in the chat box. Thank you for joining us again today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about voter registration and how to begin building your disability voting block with a voter registration campaign. We have three presenters today, myself, Ted Jackson, I'm the statewide community organizer for California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, and I offer technical assistance, professional development, and support to the Systems Change Network. Also with us today is Fred Neeson. Fred Neeson is a staff attorney at Disability Rights California. Fred is a member of the State Bars of California and Nevada. From 1997 to 1999, he was a disability rights attorney for the Nevada Disability Advocacy and Law Center, Nevada's protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities. At NDALC, he dealt with various, various aspects of disability rights law. And since 1999, he's worked for Disability Rights California. Since June of 2000, he has been a staff attorney in the Bay Area Regional Office. And this focus is mainly on housing and public benefits. So we're um, happy to have him with us today. Fred, is your speech to speech set up? Yes, I'm back on. Yes, I'm back on. Thank you very much. And then we also have Jeff Cohen, who's a systems change organizer um, with PERS in Placer County at the Placer Independent Living Resource Center. And Jeff's been doing a lot of work around voting for many years in the Auburn area and in the Placer County area, and has been a part of many voter registration campaigns and get out the vote campaigns. And so we're very lucky to have him with us today, too. How are you today, Jeff? Maybe Jeff's mic is not on yet, so I'm going to go ahead and go here. And our agenda today is that we're going to be discussing an ongoing process, and that is the history of voting in America. We're going to begin with a short overview of the history of voting in America and how it really is a process towards inclusion and has been for a couple of hundred years. And then um, Fred is going to jump on and talk to us about voter ID laws. Uh, an examination of this new trend in America. At that point, we'll have time for questions and answers. And uh, then we'll move on with Jeff to voter registration drives. And Jeff's going to talk to us about the tools for engaging eligible voters. After that section, we'll have time for Q&A as well. And then we're going to end on a section that we call Beyond Boundaries. And that's reaching out for new voters beyond our own organizational boundaries and we'll have time for question and answer and some role plays at that point in time. At the end of the webinar, there will be some resources and a survey. We like to learn to get better, so please uh, take a moment to take the survey at the end. And we will have some resources for you to download, one of which will be um, a script that you could use when out registering voters, and then the other one uh, that you'll be able to download is a fact sheet called Disability and Voter Turnout in the 2010 Elections by Lisa Schur and Douglas Cruz from the Rutgers University School of Management and Labor Relations. So let's begin with a little bit of history of voting in America, which really has been an ongoing process. On this next slide, we have a picture. And it's a picture of one of the systems change organizers from the Berkeley area in her power chair. And she is uh, wearing the <clears throat> Feel the Power of the Disability Vote t-shirt, the blue t-shirt uh, that comes from the nth degree. And our slide here says, the electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot. This comes from the US Constitution. It's stated in the 12th Amendment, which is ratified by the states in 1791. Voting is the foundation of our democracy. 
and an important civil right. Voting and political participation are essential privileges of community membership. Not being able to vote is a denial of citizenship. Therefore, as citizens, we have the right and responsibility to cast our votes and participate in the governing of our communities. Every election affects each of us. The policies developed and implemented by those who we elect impact us every day. And here we see on this next slide is um, some photos of a play that was put on by the 7th Street Center for the Arts in Chico, California at this year's Disability Capital Action Day in Sacramento in May of 2012. In the first picture on the left is a group of actors all of whom are developmentally disabled and they're doing a play about voting and they're expressing uh, their desire to vote and to register to vote. And then to the right in the next picture, there's a picture of Uncle Sam, Abraham Lincoln uh, together who are talking to the crowd about, um, about registering to vote and the importance of registering to vote. And there's, uh, next to them is Susan B. Anthony and these are all actors from this troupe playing these roles. At the bottom it says voting is a part of everyone's history in America and the point of their play is that no matter what, every eligible American should be able to vote and register to vote. So voter registration campaigns are designed to give as many people as possible an opportunity to participate in the political process. Each contribution, be it of time, talent, or ideas is an important component in making the voting and election process user friendly and accessible to all citizens. In addition, voting promotes inclusion, independence, and community participation. A successful nonpartisan voter campaign leads to increased voter registration. This campaign also leads to the formation of a constituency that is knowledgeable about relevant policy issues mobilized to help get out the vote and educate others and is documented and recognized as an important voting force. In California, as in other states, people with disabilities have not yet organized politically in the way other groups have. We have not yet demonstrated to politicians that people with disabilities are a voting block. Legislators need to see individuals with disabilities, their families, and friends as a force on the political scene. This means involvement. To be a force, we must use our capacity to deliver votes. Voting is the foundation of our democracy and one of the most important civil rights of all, for all citizens. It's the cornerstone of empowerment and for too long people with disabilities have been disenfranchised by the voting process. So now we're going to talk about the American model and how we got to where we are today because a lot of nations vote around the globe, but there's something very unique about the American voting model. For us, the past sort of came together in the British colonial days. At that time, it became very fashionable to do reading and writing about the ancient Greeks and Romans, and people began to share those ideas. And from the Greeks, they were reminded of the Greek democracy, or demos kratos, which means people power. And in the Greek democracy, people actually served on served in the legislature like a, a jury system. And they were also reminded of the Roman Republic, the res publica, which means public affair, and that was a representative form of government. And so we saw the combination of those two in the discussions that led to the birth of our nation and the birth of our voting system. And they also um, learned from the Native Americans about accountability to the people. Our voting system today uh, um, is one of the most replicated and consulted around the globe, and this collaboration has fostered a process. So it begins with the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation from 1774 to 1788, really the birth of our nation. It's really interesting to think that the very first time folks came together in 1774 and then signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and they elected their first president of the Continental Congress. There were only 56 delegates from 12 colonies who were, and those uh, delegates were elected by their peers in colonial as assemblies. So 56 people actually chose uh, the top CEO of our nation at the beginning. There were 16 presidents actually before George Washington who were president of the Continental Congress and had some um, 
uh, some limited uh, power. Peyton Randolph was the first. Uh, John Hancock was the most famous. And they served a six week to two year term um, in that to change to a one year term in 1781. Uh, the interesting thing is that only um, one person served the role twice. Not many of them seem to want the role much more uh, than once. And uh, the electorate was selective. That's the important thing to uh, remember here. But the distinction is that they were free men and not royal. So for the first time, it was from the population that we had this type of election and power. Just hold on for one moment, folks. I'm just going to do a, a technical um, thing here really quickly. Thank you. All right. And from the beginning, the disability voice has been part of the process with leaders like Stephen Hopkins, a man with cerebral palsy, uh, was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And he is known for his famous saying, my hands may tremble, but my heart does not. So the process continues in 1789 with the new constitution and the addition of more voters from Congress to the Electoral College. There were no voting rights in the original U.S. Constitution. Each state had separate, separate laws. And the 12th Amendment to the Constitution added the election of the president. Uh, but the important distinction here is at that time, only free white male property owners could vote. When we reached conflict in the lead up to the Civil War, rights were extended to white men who did not own property. And on the right side of the screen here, we do have um, an image of a ballot box from the 1800s. It's a wooden box with a counter on front and a uh, trap door on the top and a crank. And I'm not exactly sure how it works. Um, after the Civil War, the Reconstruction Amendments gave a pathway to voting to black Americans. And to uh, the left here on the screen, we have a painting of Congress that is their voting on the Reconstruction Amendments. The Reconstruction Amendments were the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment gave citizenship to former slaves. And the 15th Amendment added voting rights for black men, but black men only, not women. And then struggle produces strength. Um, we had some setbacks with Jim Crow laws, which were post-Reconstruction efforts to limit freedom to black Americans. It grew uh, and created voting barriers, such as poll taxes and literacy tests. Similarly, at the same time, we see the emergence of what we call ugly laws, what were known as ugly laws. Um, several American cities had ugly laws, making it illegal for persons with unsightly or as they call disgusting disabilities to appear in public. And in the <clears throat> post-Civil War era, we have the Civil Rights Movement comes out of this step backwards as people gather together to become stronger and to move forward and continue the process. And by the 1920s, they start to come together to remove the barriers. The 19th Amendment passed in 1920 extended the right to vote to women. And right after that, we see um, a couple of things. Um, two governors who were women were elected in Wyoming and Texas, Nellie Ross and Miriam Ferguson. They were the first elected female governors. In 1965, we're removing more barriers in America with the Voting Rights Act, which banned literacy tests and provided federal enforcement. And by the 1990s, as a result of that, blacks hold the majority of offices in the state of Mississippi, which had been quite different beforehand. And then in 1970, the Voting Rights Act provided for language assistance for non-English speakers. So now we're starting to think beyond gender and beyond race, but really into other uh, ethnic barriers that are around us. By the 1980s, uh, we start to finally address accessibility in voting. In 1984, 
we passed the Voting Accessibility for the Elderly and Handicap Act of 1984, which required polling places for federal election to be accessible to people with disabilities, as well as access to registration and voter cards. States must help people with dis disabilities register and vote. If no accessible polling place is available, people with disabilities must be given another way to vote. And the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, of 1990. People with disabilities must be given assistance when registering to vote and cast their vote. Polling places must be accessible. Accessible polling places means the parking paths to the polling place, entrances, exits, and voting areas are easy for people with disabilities to use. And here we have an image in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide of a woman in a wheelchair opening the door to her polling place to go in. And um, there is a sign on the, the plate glass door that says, polling place vote here. And then there is a disabled access sign in the other door. So let's talk about bringing it on home and all this progress to California. California passed Proposition 41, approved by California voters in the March 2002 elections. This proposition provides counties with the funding to update their voting systems by offering state matching funds when they purchase new voting systems. The Accessible Voting Technology Act of 2002 requires that voters who are blind or visually impaired have the opportunity to cast and verify their ballot independently. And at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, we do have an image of an Automark machine. It's an Automark accessible voting machine. It looks somewhat like a photocopier with the top lid sticking up at an angle. Um, in 2002, the Help America Vote Act Vote Act passed, also known as HAVA, and Fred's going to talk to us about HAVA in just a moment. I'm going to cover a little bit of the accessibility in it, and then he's going to reference it in terms of voter ID laws and how that bounced off that movement. So HAVA sets the rules for voting systems in federal elections. These rules include making sure voting systems are accessible for voters with disabilities. Accessible means that the voting system is easy to use privately and independently. And I'll just flip back really quickly. We've got two images on this particular slide. Um, a gentleman to the top right is using uh, earphones on an accessible voting machine. And on the bottom left, there is a woman in a wheelchair that is using an Automark accessible voting machine. So by January 1st, 2006, every precinct must have at least one voting machine or system that is accessible to voters with disabilities. This includes blind and low vision voters. Each voter must be able to vote secretly and by him or herself. Elections officials and poll workers must be trained to help voters with disabilities. And on this slide, we have a picture of an elderly gentleman using an Automark machine. It's in the top right-hand corner of the slide, and a poll worker stands next to him assisting him. And so now I want to introduce Fred Neeson. Fred, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, Fred. And Fred's going to talk to us today about voter ID laws. Fred, you're on. Okay, thank you. First, I will talk about the federal law. Election. 
we pass the Help America Vote Act? Um, uh, I'm sorry, please repeat. The Help America Vote Act. Did you say the Help America Vote Act? I'm sorry, please. Every voter. Every voter. So I had to show ID. At least one time. To make sure that people on my place. To make sure that people are not To make sure that people were not voting twice. And that no other sex. And that no other sex. Such. Would really taking place. I'm sorry? F-I-N-D. And no other such fraud was taking place? Please repeat. They were not the same. They were not the same. 
Michigan. Alabama. Alabama. Hawaii. Hawaii. And Florida. And Florida. And the lumber. And the lazy choir.
in Hava. In Hava, H A V A. In Hava. What? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, and now we're going to open up the floor to questions about anything you've seen so far about the history of voting and our progress um, in process to inclusion in America, um, about how we have come forward and, and gone forward, and um, really each generation has had something to add about widening the freedom to voting for more and more people, as well as, um, and I think most importantly, about what Fred just talked about and the Help America Votes Act and voter ID laws and the growing movement that we're seeing across the country. Does anyone have any questions for Fred or about anything they've seen so far? Uh, you can ra use the raise hands function if you have questions. Uh, if you're on the teleconference line, you can go ahead and speak up. Are there any questions out there? Yeah, we have a question from Barbara. And Barbara, if um, are you on the teleconference line? Do you want to speak up? Or if you're on a headset, you can click the microphone at the bottom of your um, screen, and it'll allow you to speak if you're on a headset. Or you can type your um, question into the chat box, and I'll read it. Barbara, if you want to um, type your question into the chat box, I'll read it. I just increased the maximum number of uh, speakers. So Barbara, if you're on headset, maybe you want to speak your question. just by clicking the microphone down at the bottom, left-hand side of your screen. Dolores from Hayward, California says, great information. Barbara has a question for us. She typed it into the chat box, and it says, why don't all states have the same identity requirements? That's a good question. Fred? Uh, that is a good question. 
and great answer. Thank you very much for your question, Barbara and Fred. Thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to um, to have you with us, and you gave us really, really great, thorough information. And uh, I know that we really appreciate it. So now we're going to move on to the next phase of our training today, and we're going to talk about voter registration drives. And um, so I'm going to hand it off to Jeff Cohen from Placer County. And Jeff, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me, Ted? I certainly yeah, I'm can. Here. Can you hear me? We certainly can hear you. OK, good. Great. So Jeff's going to talk to us good. about voter registration drives. OK, so one of the most important things we can be doing over the next several months is getting folks registered to vote in the November election. This is going to be a really important election for people with disabilities, um, not just because of the candidates that are on the ballot, but also because of some of the initiatives that will be on the uh, California and, uh, and some of the local initiatives as well. So right now, our job is to really get out there, get folks registered, let them know how important it is to be registered. And so we're going to talk about how to do that and how to make sure that it's done correctly. So um, on the slide, you can see a small picture of a, of a voter registration card. Um, they're available at your local registrar's office. I do want to say that each county has a little bit different registration form. I have one in front of me right now. They all look pretty much the same, but at the top of mine, it says Placer County. So wherever you're registering, um, whichever county you're in, you want to make sure that you get the correct counties uh, registration forms. You can get those from your local registrar's office. Um, and uh, for some of us, uh, we work in multiple counties. I work in Placer, El Dorado, and Alpine. So I need to make sure that I have the correct one, depending on what day of the week it is. So um, 
when you go to your registrar's office, they'll give you as many forms as you ask for. But if you ask for 50 or more registration cards, which many of us will do, there's a short one-page form that you have to fill out. It's real simple. They just want your name and who you're with, and um, they want a very, very short plan for distribution. And this is like a one or two sentence plan. Um, mine basically says that we're going to um, distribute them to people with disabilities um, through our office and through our volunteers. And that's pretty much our plan. So don't let the plan for distribution throw you. You'll see that on the Secretary of State's website that you have to have a plan. And when I first saw that, I thought, oh, man, more paperwork. It really isn't. It's just a one or two sentence thing. So don't let that throw you. Next slide. So when you're distributing the voter registration cards, one of the most important things for us to do is to stay nonpartisan. Don't show support for any candidate, any party, any initiative, even if you're engaged in conversation with a potential registrant. Folks will want to engage you, tell you their views, and try and engage you in a way that uh, you know they, they'll elicit your views on a certain candidate or, or party or initiative or what have you. You really have to be careful that you don't get into that conversation. Um, my technique is to kind of smile and shrug in a non-committal way. And that kind of lets them speak their mind, but I'm not I'm not agreeing. I'm not disagreeing. I'm simply being noncommittal, letting them say their piece, and staying nonpartisan. Don't be drawn into conversations about the politics, because that's not what we're doing right now. Later on in the process, and I think our next training will be talking more about candidate forums and initiative forums, that's when you can talk more about the issues. But when you're registering people, you don't want to be drawn into the talking about the issues. It's simply registration that we're trying to do. After you fill out the form with the person, you want to make sure that they um, get the receipt that's at the bottom of the card. It's a tear-off little piece, and uh, it's it, it's real simple. It has uh, the um, your signature, uh, your name, address, telephone number, and your organization name, so that they know who it was that helped them fill this out. In case there are any questions or problems down the road, the registrar can can get in touch with you and work through them. So when you're filling out the registration card, um, this is something that you really have to help folks pay attention to. You have to make sure that all the sections are filled in, that it's legible. You want to try and make sure that people write in a way that uh, the registrar can can understand what they're saying. Some of the things that people forget to do is you have to sign this. There's a big box at the bottom that's, uh, that has a signature and, and a date line for you to sign it. Um, there's a place for the birth date. And um, quite often, what folks will do there is they'll put down their um, the today's date instead of their date of birth. So you want to pay attention to that one. A lot of times folks don't want to um, choose an ethnicity. Um, and I'm trying to see where that is on here. Forget that one. Uh, and then the other one that a lot of folks don't want to do is um, fill out their their party preference. There is a box that says no party preference. So they need to check something. They can check a party if they want to, or they can check no party preference. So it, it's um, either way is OK. Um, next slide. So accessibility. Here's the thing, is you can get the forms in PDF format. And some screen readers and whatnot can deal with PDF formats, but not easily from the information that I've gotten. So if you can use the PDF format, uh, for it to be more accessible, that's fine. But really, when you're talking about accessibility in registering to vote, um, the thing is, is that you're going to want to ask other people to help you. You can ask. Uh, folks can ask you as a voter registration drive person, or they can ask volunteers. They can ask their family, friends, or the county registrar's office. My experience with the county registrar's office has been very positive. They really want to help people get registered, and they'll go out of their way to help people fill out these forms. Next slide. So. 
you as the person that's helping with these, you can mail these forms if the person requests it. Um, personally, I think that's the best way to do it because then you know it's been returned. So when I'm doing one of these, I have them fill it out, I give them their receipt, and then I actually do the mailing. Now the thing is, is if you if uh, if you do that, you want to make sure to follow up with your registrar's office. Make sure that they've got it, that it's been, uh, that they've, that they have been registered. If the person takes it away with them to fill out on their own, you want to follow up with them and make sure that they've um, completed and returned it. Quite often in our office, people will take a registration form away with them after they sign up with us in our office, and um, we we don't know whether they filled it out or not. So what we try and do is follow up and ask them, you know, a week or two later, hey, did you fill that out? Did you mail it in? And that follow up is really important to get more registrations done. Um, if you're in a situation where you want to mail registration cards, you can do that, um, but you might you have to make sure that it's a, uh, that you have a letter with it that says that they don't have to do anything with the application if they're already registered or if they don't want to do it. Um, that's a really important point. Next slide. So the Secretary of State's office has a really good website with a lot of good information on it. And this slide here shows uh, a little banner that you'll see when you go to that website. Um, and uh, you want to make sure before you get into a voter registration drive that you go to this website and you look at the resources that they have. There's some really good information there. Um, one thing that's important that um, that we heard of recently was that the registration cards weren't being returned. If you gather a card from someone, you have to make sure that it's returned within three business days to your local elections office, and that's business days. Um, you can't wait a week, you can't wait two weeks, you can't wait a month. They have to be done in three business days. The registrar's office takes this very seriously, and there's information on this in the Secretary of State's um, information about it, but you don't want to hold to these. Once you get them filled out, you want to get them over to the registrar as soon as possible. Um, a lot of folks that do a lot of registrations, they just do a regular trip over to the registrar's office. You can do that every few days, every week, and just drop off all the ones that you have. Hopefully we have some folks that are going to be doing that volume. Um, especially if you're on my team at the SC Network, I hope that you're going to have that kind of volume. Um, and then also, red folks can fill this out and take responsibility for returning their own form. Um, that's up to them. In that situation, you don't have any control over the three business days, but the registrar's office will work with them on it. So for the next election, the November election, the deadline for registration is Monday, October 22nd. If you don't have them done by then, folks won't be able to vote in the November election. So we have a deadline that's set in stone to get these done. Jeff, can you, next Jeff, can slide? you describe the, the visual image at sure. the top of the page before we move to the next slide? Thank you. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, it's the Secretary of State's uh, um, website, and it's at California Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, and it has her picture and her seal, and then there are several little slogans, all people, liberty, speak. There's some that are kind of grayed out that I can't really read, but it's just some principles of voting that are, that are listed on that, on that banner. And this slide here, um, is actually a, a screenshot of what you'll see when you go to the Secretary of State's website. And you'll see there are a lot of resources on there. There's a lot of good information, a lot of helpful information if you're going to be doing a registration drive. There's also information for individual voters, um, voter rights. Um, there's uh, uh, different languages so that folks can have it translated into a variety of languages if they need that. Um, it's a really good, well put together site with a lot of good information. Next slide. And this is a, a screenshot. Uh, this shows uh, the different areas um, in the voting section that you can look at. 
and on mine I can't really see the detail on it, but it. Um, but when you go to this site, you'll see that there's just a wealth of information here, all kinds of things that will help you be better at doing registrations, um, and also for individuals to help them be a better voter. Um, I'll just jump in here for Jeff because I can see it a little Next better. Slide. But um, sure. on, on this particular page, you can get information about the ballot measures, which ones have qualified, which ones didn't, and, and about you know the initiative process in California, the referendum process. Um, you can get information on elections, about upcoming elections, the logistical information, even statistics on prior elections. Uh, campaign finance laws, political parties, redistricting, um, voting systems, that's going to be very important for all of you, oversight, laws and standards, certifications, approvals of vendors, uh, voter registration, how to register to vote, here's where you can get your guide to voter registration drives by the Secretary of State, which will be um, emailed out to everyone who attends today as part of your materials packet. Um, and then just, you know, overseas voters, voting by mail, resources for new voters, finding your polling place, provisional balloting, county elections offices, um, and then there's a special voters with disabilities page, and you can even look up and see on this, from this page, what voting machine your county has. And so now I'm going to um, move it on to the next slide and hand it back to Jeff. Thank you. Okay. So here's some uh, of the links that you'll be able to to look at on the um, some of the resources on the Secretary of State's website. Um, you'll see there's quite a few. Uh, there's the register to vote, of course. Um, there's information about voting by mail. That's a really good option, and our local office is really pushing voting by mail, um, and uh, we're, we're in a partially rural area, and so it really works well for folks in rural areas, because it may be quite a ways to go to your precinct to vote, and it just makes sure, um, it just makes it easier. Anything that makes it easier to vote is, is going to be a good thing. So there's information about voting by mail. Um, military and overseas voters, um, this is an important thing right now with so many folks in the military from our area that aren't uh, that are overseas um, they can vote and and can register um, the National Voter Registration Act information is there there's some statistics and a and a um, and a registration project link as well next slide and here's some more resources that they have Uh, there's information for new voters. Um, there's information on how to find your polling place. If you're not sure, come voting day, where it is you're supposed to go, you can look it up and it'll tell you right on the web from the Secretary of State's office where you're supposed to go to vote. Um, has information on provisional voting. Provisional voting is for when you get to the polling place and for some reason there's a glitch in the system. Maybe you went to the wrong um, polling place or something along those lines. What you can do is a, what's called a provisional vote vote and they will take your ballot, but they'll hold it and they'll check it and make sure they're registered, make sure that everything is good and then they'll count it. So provisional voting is really important. If you show up at the wrong place or, or there's some glitch, ask to do a provisional vote. And we're just showing you... Um, um, one of the resources that uh, Ted's going to send to all of us is this next slide here. It's the Guide to Voter. Go ahead. Hello. Oh, I think I think we crossed paths there. I'm sorry about that, Jeff. Go ahead. Okay. So um, this 
those are the guide to voter registration drives. And I think Ted's going to make sure that we each have one of these. Um, it's really important to go over this, um, especially right now, because it's, a, um, it's kind of in a, a little bit of a slow time right now. It's a good time to be doing your background work and doing your research. And now's a really good time to spend time with this guide to voter registration drives. And just go through it, get familiar with how to do it, what your expectations are from the Secretary of State and your Registrar's Office. Um, this is a really good project to be working on right now. So if you need to update your registration, and sometimes you'll run across folks that are registered, but they need to update it. And this may be because they've moved. Um, maybe they've changed their name because of a recent marriage or divorce, for that matter. Um, yeah, if you want to become a permanent absentee voter, that means that you mail in your vote, you mail in your ballot each time instead of going to a polling place. You want to update your voter registration. If you change your political party choice, which many people are doing these days, um, I think now one of the most uh, um, popular uh, party affiliations is none of the above. So uh, if you want to change uh, you, your political party choice, you want to update your registration. And also, so if you haven't voted in the past few elections, I'm sure this doesn't apply to any of us. But if you miss a few elections, you want to update your registration. Next slide. So one of the things that our register, like I mentioned, is really pushing is absentee voting or, or voting by mail. Um, once you get your application into the county elections official, your ballot will be mailed to you. You'll get it quite a, quite a bit ahead of the, of the election. You won't get it near the election. Um, so you'll be actually be voting early. Um, and you want to make sure that you that you complete your ballot, make sure that all the information on the envelope is filled out and correct, and then you can um, return it uh, several different ways. You can mail it uh, to the local county official's office. You can return it to a polling place, any polling place will do, or the elections office on election day, or you can authorize someone to return the ballot for you if they're heading to the poll or if you want them to go by the registrar's office. Um, next slide. The important thing about um, mail-in voting, absentee voting, is it has to be received by the county elections office by the time polls close at 8 o'clock on election day. Just because it's postmarked or what have you, it doesn't matter. If you put it in the mail on election day, it won't count. It has to be in their hands by 8 o'clock on election day. So you don't want to wait till the last minute to put it in the mail. Um, if you do come up to that last minute and you haven't mailed it, take it to a local polling place or the registrar's and, office uh, and drop it Before we move on to the next slide, the image is here of an, a gentleman walking up the stairs into a polling place on election night towards the end of the evening. And the shot okay. is, the picture shot is from the bottom of the stairs up into the building. So here's something that has come up several times in my work is um, folks that are homeless. Um, you don't have to have a home address to vote. Um, you can register to vote and you can vote if you're homeless and don't have an address. And for um, many people with disabilities, um, this is the situation that they're finding themselves in these days. So this is an untapped resource, in my opinion, to get the disability vote out. Um, when you're filling out the address section, um, you can simply put a cross street. Um, and it says right on the form that I'm looking at, if you don't have a street address, describe where you live. For instance, cross streets, route, north, south, east, west. So you just put uh, you know, the corner that you hang out on the most or, the, or uh, park, wherever you may be. So next slide. So here's another one that often 
is overlooked. People sometimes think that once you have a felony record that you lose the right to vote. And it's not true. Unless you're incarcerated in a local jail or a state or federal penitentiary of some sort, you can vote um, as long as you're not on parole or currently incarcerated. Um, people with felony records regain the right to vote as soon as they discharge their parole or as soon as they're finished with their with their issues. Um, the other thing, and this is another, I think, really big untapped resource for people with disabilities is folks that have been in a conservatorship situation. Thing is, is people that have been conserved don't lose their right to vote necessarily. It has to be specific in the court order that their right to vote has been removed from them. So even if they're conserved for financial reasons or safety issues or what have you, they still have the right to vote. And this is a group that we can really tap into. And I've had some really neat successes in this area where folks have voted for the first time and they never knew they could before. And it's really moving to see that something like that happen. Next slide. OK, so that ends up, and I do want to answer um, Dolores' question. You know, I have the form right in front of me, and you're correct. The ethnicity is optional. Um, it, it is good for statistical reasons to fill out the optional places if you can. Um, and uh, it is important that we get statistics as to who's voting and what their demographics are. We want to make sure that, that that we're tracking in some way the importance of minority votes, um, regardless of whether it's an ethnic minority um, or uh, disability or what have you. So anytime we can gather those kind of statistics, it's important. It is on the form, and you're, you're correct. It is optional. Does anyone else have any questions for Jeff about the information he just went over? You can use your raised hands function. If you're on the teleconference line, you can speak up, or you can um, enter your question into the chat box and I'll read it for everyone. All right, so we're going to move on. If you do have questions um, that pop up, if you think of something later, um, you can put it into the chat box. And um, we will keep an eye on those. We keep those questions that are in there. And we can certainly, um, if something pops up that we don't get to, that you have a question about, we can um, go back and get those questions answered and um, send them out to you. So we're going to move on to the final part. But we have one, we have one hand raised. Um, and it's Barbara. Yes, Barbara, Barbara has my a question. friend. Barbara has a question. I think she's going to type it in. OK, great. And while we're um, waiting for Barbara to type in her question, um, I will remind you that we will be sending materials out to everyone. Um, Rosemary did send us a couple of materials, Word documents already. And we will be sending out the Secretary of State's Guide to Voter Registration via email to everyone, as well as a PowerPoint, I'm sorry, um, as well as an Adobe file, of a PDF of this presentation so that you have these uh, notes. OK, so Barbara, Tagalog is a, is a Filipino language, I believe. That is correct. All right, so we're going to move forward here. And we're nearing the end of our training today. Um, thank you for your question, Barbara. And thank you for the answer, um, Jeff. Uh, we are going a little bit over our scheduled time because due to some technical difficulties at the beginning, we got a late start. Um, so for those of you who have to leave, this will this training will be recorded, and you'll be able to watch it on the Systems Change Network website, scnetca.org. Uh, for those of you who can stay, thank you very much. And we apologize if this caused any inconvenience for anyone. So now we're going to talk about going beyond boundaries of our organization. 
We've talked a little bit about the history of voting in America, current issues with voting around HAVA, Help America Vote Act, as well as uh, voter ID laws. And then Jeff went into quite a lot of detail about some really good information about voter registration drives and resources. Now that we have that information, we really want to think about branching out and building a disability voting block here in California, which means that we're going to have to go beyond our office spaces and our individual organizations and really reach out to the community and reach beyond uh, just the community of people with disabilities, but to the community at large and educate folks about issues concerning people with disabilities and discover who our allies are and make sure they're registered to vote and that we maintain a relationship with them uh, around voting. So building a disability voting block. How do we get it? How can we keep it? And what do we do with it? And those are the uh, questions that I think you're going to find answered in this next section. The most important thing and idea that I want to leave with folks today is that Organized people plus organized resources equals political power. And that's so very important for us as we look at building um, community organizing around voter registration. So the first thing we want to think about going beyond our own centers and our own organizations is what's important to you. And things like Olmstead implementation, transportation, housing, employment, education, community accessibility, protecting access to health care, integrated health care, program funding. Um, how many of these issues do you think that your state and federal policymakers impact? And it's very, very important because when we think about growing anything like an organization or like a voter registration team, we have to start with ourselves. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But we have to think about the issues that are important to us and that they might be important to other people. And those are issues on which we can engage people and to make sure that they register to vote and get them to see the importance in being a part of our voting block and being a part of a team. So who else votes? Older adults are 14% of Americans, and they have an 85% voter turnout rate. That's a really high voter turnout rate. Most are represented in the United States today by the AARP, and they recently gained national attention on their efforts to pass a prescription drug bill that would reduce drug costs. That's an example where they used an issue that was continuous around older Americans and really, really galvanize them to turn out to vote at a very high rate. So that's an example of an established voter block that has been galvanized to move around an issue. Another uh, voter block that's important to pay attention to are labor unions. They represent only 8% of Americans, but they have a 90% voter turnout because they're highly organized, well organized. And they're some of the most highly sought after voting blocks for many politicians and candidates. So now let's take a look at the disability community and the numbers around voting. Numbers always tell the truth. The disability community is 20% of, po of the population which votes at a rate of 40%. We really, really need to get that percentage up and that's why it needs to be a priority for all of our organizations to start doing voter registration campaigns and spending time on educating voters about the issues important to people with disabilities. It's currently 8% 8, 8 of the electorate, and so the need is huge, but the possibilities are huge too when you think about the fact that the disability community is 20% of the population. We do have the possibility of being one of the most significant voting blocks in the entire nation if we can get that voting rate up. By increasing voter turnout among people with disabilities, the disability community will have a voice on issues that impact their lives and become a powerful political force. So here's how we get started. I know a lot of folks that I've spoken to um, 
talk to me and they, they say, gosh, I mean, look at all these big voting blocks. Look at all these big organizations that do voter registration. And what you have to understand is that folks always start small. It always starts with you. And you make the commitment and then you just do it. You start inside and growing outside. So start with your center. Start with your office. Start with your family. Start with the three or four people closest to you that might think that this is important. And start registering the people to vote near you. Um, begin registering voters like yourself, your neighbors, your family members. And don't forget to ask for help. It's really important that we ask for help because in order for anything to grow, one single person can't do everything. So they do need to ask for help. This is what I talk about, um, call talk to the hand. And I really think of a, a community centered around one person is really five people and it resembles a hand, to, a hand to me. You're the thumb and you give support and you outreach through your fingers. And your fingers are a friend, a family member, a neighbor, and a colleague. By just registering your hand, you started by registering five people registering yourself and then going to a friend, a family member, a neighbor, and a colleague and getting them to register to vote. And then the next, step, the next step in stage is to ask your fingers or your friends, families, neighbors, and coworkers to go out and register their personal network. And that grows and grows and grows. Start small but grow big. So if you want to have a voter registration team, here are some things that you need to think about. Obviously, some teams are going to be, um, and some, some organizations are going to be prepared to start today with filling all of these positions. Some folks are going to start smaller. For some folks, it's just one person with a, a good intention and all the heart in the world and a clipboard, and they're going to go out and register their friends, and they're going to build a team from the ground up. But once you've gotten that team, here are some roles that you want to fill. One is the team leader. The team leader supports the team members and offers them assistance and resources. The team leader also spends time developing the strategy, like locations and events to collect registrations and building coalitions with other organizations to partner with. You want to have a volunteer coordinator. Volunteer coordinators help you recruit and confirm and train your volunteers for their voter registration shift. You definitely want to have a materials coordinator. Anyone who's done a lot of voter registration drives knows that you need materials. You need clipboards, pens, obviously you need voter registration cards, but then maybe even scripts. And if your organization has a handout about issues that are important to people with disabilities to engage folks, as well as maybe a pledge that you might have people sign so that you can retain their information, which we'll talk about in a moment. The materials coordinator is responsible for producing and preparing the materials like the clipboards and the packets that we just talked about for voter registration shifts. The next position that you want to have in your office or your organization is a data retention coordinator. It's not just enough to go out and register lots and lots of people to vote. We need to have a living memory of who those people are, who you registered to vote so that you can at some point invite them back to your organization when you're ready to do candidate forums, issue forums, or any type of community forum that engages them into the issues that are important to you and your community so that you can educate them. This person is going to coordinate the data entry and organization of information about the new voters. Whether it comes, whether your organization is all right with photocopying the voter registration cards or whether or not uh, they have people sign a pledge to capture their data. This person is going to put all of that together and keep it organized for you. And then you want a VCR, I'm sorry, a VRC delivery coordinator. This person delivers the voter registration cards to the registrar of voters on a regular basis and most importantly develops a relationship with ROV staff. So in your office within your organization, if you remember Jeff talked about having three business days to return those voter registration cards. And he also talked about some organizations do a weekly drop. 
But you always want to have that be the same person, the same person that goes whatever that is, every three days, or maybe it's every Thursday at 3 o'clock or whatever time you assign. And they go down there and they drop off the voter registration cards for the week. That way, if there's any other, any, if there's any ever, if there's ever any question about the validity of the cards, there's a trust relationship built with that specific person and the person doing the intake of the voter registration cards at the registrar of voters. Very important. And then the last thing you need, of course, is volunteers. And in fact, it's probably the first thing you need. Because every volunteer is a part of your team, and your future leadership team members are from your volunteer pool. So for those of you who don't have a large staff working on a project like this, and you just have one or two people, this is actually where you want to start, getting volunteers involved. Because it's through volunteers becoming involved and surprising you about who wants to be involved and how important voting is to them that you might find these other leadership roles on your team. So let's talk about some good places to meet new voters. Uh, your organization's office, I, you know, I said earlier, start from inside and grow outside. Uh, take a clipboard and some voter registration cards and just start by going around your office and making sure everyone's registered to vote. And then asking each person in your office, do they know two people that um, need to register to vote? College campuses are great, great places to register folks to vote. Obviously, people are coming of age to a voting age on a college campus. Um, you have a lot of people turning 18 when those freshmen come in, and I know some professional circulators that in the fall that's all they do is they hit the campuses on the days that people move into the dorms. Churches are a wonderful place. Um, what I've always thought about uh, voting and voters is that churches probably have the best voters because the type of people who make a commitment to getting up early in the morning and going to church on a Sunday morning, one of their only days off in the week and do that for their whole lives are the type of people that never miss an election. So they're good places to, to meet people who are uh, willing to vote, well, wanting to register to vote. Um, interestingly enough, Department of Motor Vehicles is a great place to register people to vote. I know that they do voter registration inside the DMV, but I've spent uh, a lot of time out in front of DMVs. And oddly enough, people tell the person inside, no, I don't want to register to vote when they're in there, which is a much quicker process. It's like checking off a box. But um, oddly enough, when they come out and if you talk to them, they're more likely to actually um, speak to you and register, um, register to vote. Maybe it's because you don't actually work for the government. I'm not, not exactly sure. Um, coalition organizations and meetings. So um, uh, getting to those different organizations and meetings is important. Grocery stores, uh, mega stores and shopping malls, busy street corners, bus and public transit stops, community and campaign events and rallies. Um, here's the important thing to note about grocery stores, mega stores, and shopping malls. With a lot of those places, you may need to request permission, and, um, and so you want to call in advance. For example, I know that Walmart will allow you to stand out in front. Actually, they'll allow you to be at a table um, in a designated area. They own their own parking lots, so they are, al allow, um, they are allowed to have a little bit more control over the traffic in front of their stores. And um, you have to call. You can only come once a month. Um, Target stores are, have a similar policy. It depends on whether they own their parking lots or not. Uh, there was a court ruling uh, about a year, year and a half ago. Um, regarding the parking lots and whether stores own the parking lots or not. So you, if you're going to a large store, you want to make a call in advance. But it's also a really good idea because you want to build a relationship with those stores. I want to thank you all for attending today's training. For more information about the Systems Change Network and our programs and trainings, please visit us at www.scnetca.org. And thank you for participating in today's webinar.